This is the first of eight photos from Grand Union Dreams. Shirley was immortal. Fernando and Valda were heroes. I was one of the gods. It was done about a year ago. In this first photo, Epp and James are engaged in a duet. David and Yvonne have just finished dragging them on the fake grass in a small arc. When they stand, they undulate their upper bodies in unison while passing the red ball back and forth. They are about to pick up the grass and involve it in their undulations. Valda waits. My question is, what does it mean? Are they celebrating something? Yes, that sounds good. F and James are doing a dance of pleasure at the advent of spring. It actually was spring when we began working on this piece, and I first met you, Fernando. I think some people went over to your house after that first rehearsal. You ask if we had any booze. That was where I first had a hint of your humor, the look on your face when you asked. Yes, I remember the look you gave me. I thought, oh, I'm discovered in my discomfort, but he's sympathetic. Ah, uh, there's the suitcase, and there's Trisha. Trisha has come down from Olympus and has laboriously pulled her way toward the group of mortals who are putting the squeeze on the heroes, especially on Ep, who is squeezing the red ball. In this photo, she has just said, she is my very dear friend, and I don't like seeing her caught in the middle. And there's Fernando in the box. With the suitcase. Why does Fernando have the suitcase? Is he going away, or has he just arrived? Why is he in the box with the suitcase? Is he trying it out as a body-supporting device? And what is in the suitcase? Dirty socks? The complete works of Aristotle in Greek. On the stairs. I was going up the stairs and I heard my name. I didn't even know who was calling me, but I felt it in my spine. Something about your voice, and I turned around and it was you. Uh-huh. I didn't know there was anything special about my voice at that time, but I distinctly remember seeing you on the stairs and realizing for the first time that you really were going to be taking this thing seriously, and I felt a strong surge of liking for you, and that must have shown in my voice. I was always aware of your presence. It was equivocal, sometimes sinister, and that it didn't declare itself, especially on that ride we took into the Mennonite country with Shirley and Lena. I didn't know what you were about or who you were attracted to. Actually, I hadn't intended to ask you to go, but somehow, meeting you by accident like that, passing through the doorway, I did it on the spur of the moment. Yes, and I immediately asked if Shirley and Lena could come, because I didn't want to be alone with you. Then he kept coming to the house with those messages for you. That really confused me. Not that I thought much about it in a personal way, but rather, you know, in that way that one does when you are trying to figure out someone else's intentions, whether or not they are directed at you. So I didn't really think anything about him personally until you told me about those talks you had with him about me. I think then I began to look at you differently, maybe with more curiosity. When we went to the theatre that night, I was very aware that you were sitting next to me. I don't know how aware I was that you had maneuvered to sit next to me. Do you remember, when the whole audience stood up so enthusiastically, I turned and looked at you as if to say, Oh Christ, do we have to do this too? And we stood up. Yes, I remember. Then later, I sat next to you in the pancake house, and at what point, I took out the pencil, and I was writing something which you noticed in a certain way. I was embarrassed. The night of our last performance, you said after it was over that you'd be coming to New York and that you'd like to look me up. I told you my address and said that information had my phone number. Then later at that small party, I was aware of you for no particular reason. You were across the room talking to Donald. I made that gesture with a bottle of brandy offering the last drop to anyone who wanted it before I wolfed it down. And finally, you sprang laughing up and accepted the bottle. Then later, you were lying down. As I started to leave, on impulse, I went over and lay down on top of you, saying, goodbye, Fernando, thinking it was the last time I was going to see you there. Almost instantaneously, as though you were expecting me to come to you, you grasped the back of my head and drew me down to your chest. You caressed my hair and sighed deeply. Then there was all that confusion about who would drive us to the airport. We didn't expect you. Yes, I didn't know what to think either, although I sort of knew. 
I guess I was just a little uncomfortable because you had already showed me that piece he had written for you. I regretted that later. It seemed too intimate to show to anyone, even to Shirley, but I was still not ready to acknowledge your intentions toward me. So for the moment, I had to pretend it was not as intimate or private as it later seemed to me. By the time you arrived to drive us to the airport, I knew what was going on and I was getting excited. What made you excited? It was like the excitement of performance, experiencing my beauty and value when all those eyes are focused on me. I am at my best as a performer. Why did you have to wait before getting excited? Don't you ever experience attraction to someone before you are sure whether or not they are attracted to you? Yeah, sure. But I really wasn't in that frame of mind a year ago. You know what I had just come out of. I was very depressed, so I wasn't able to use my eyes too well. Besides, I really do enjoy performing. Okay. We went back to find your... Wait, Yvonne, were you reading that? What? Those questions. Yes, why do you want to know? I just wondered. Sorry, Fernando. We went back to find your eye shape. Went upstairs, looking through the rooms. There was hardly any light. I wondered why you didn't touch me. Wondered why I didn't touch you. I stood on the landing beside the doorway as we were going back downstairs. I thought you would have to squeeze through. Oh, God, you gave me so much room. What else happened while we were rehearsing that piece? The hotel. The hotel. That's where I first got a sense of certain aspects of your mind that made you seem very different to me. I was lying on the bed and you were sitting on it. I can't remember now exactly what led us to talking about Henry Miller. Somehow we got into who influenced him. And I said Les Andres influenced him and we started to argue. Only it wasn't an argument because I simply repeated my opinion while you repeated yours. Yes, I was trying to remember the name of someone else. I still think that it was someone else. His name started with a K. No, it was Blaise Andres. Sandra, I think. So how the hell did that give you a sense of her mind? Did that seem like obscure information or something? It just had to do with that moment and Jess, I guess, her access to that particular information. Here the mortals have become an inexorable wall, shuffling forward on Kleenex box shod feet. On the right, one of the gods, David, is walking about in great agitation in very squeaky shoes. Doug stands behind Valda, obscuring her face with a gray cardboard disc. Dong stands behind Doug with a microphone. Doug reads a speech from Jung about how if you don't pass through the inferno of your passions, you'll never overcome them. Whenever we give up, leave be quote, Whenever we give up, leave behind, and forget too much, there is always the danger that the things we have neglected will return with added force." Unquote. Somehow I transposed that into David's squeaky, agitated walk, understated passion. Fernando walks backwards before the greedy wall. They are eating from a big pot, as you can see. Fernando says, See how cruel they look. Their lips are thin, their noses sharp, their faces furrowed and distorted by falls. Their eyes have a staring expression. They are always seeking something. What are they seeking? They always want something. They are always uneasy and restless. I do not know what they want. I do not understand them. I think that they are mad. That's also from Jung. He quotes a Pueblo Indian about the white man. The mortals have become cruel white men. I want to finish about the airport. I have to tell you this. When you kiss me goodbye, or rather, you were leaning against that rail with your feet crossed the way you do, and I moved in to kiss you goodbye because people had begun to board the plane. You reached for the back of my neck with your left hand and drew me toward you. Your right arm was bent, so your forearm was against your chest. As you pressed me against you and we kissed, my breast momentarily rested against your hand, which didn't move. Yes, is that what made you think of those lines? All day he sits before you face to face like a card player. Your elbow brushes his elbow. If you should speak, he hears. The touched heart madly stirs. Bullshit. Oh, for Christ's sake, Yvonne, get with it. OK, OK, go on. I'm really enjoying all this. Then I watched very carefully while you kissed Lena, and I saw that it wasn't the same at all. You see, I was still not clear. It was so obvious. As I said before, I wasn't in a state of mind to think of such things. When I got into New York, I tossed a coin about whether to call you. What would you have done if it had come out tails? I would have called you anyway, but I would have felt it was all wrong. 
You're funny. Now the hero James is reaching the climax of his brief odyssey. Tannis in the wings, harpy or avenging angel, waits to mount his back at the most difficult stage of his journey. Fernando and Valda aid and impede him at the same time, supplying resistance and support to his forward lean. The gods wait expectantly on Mount Olympus. This episode revo resolves itself as James, with Tannis riding piggyback, clambers up the stairs. On reaching the top, they crumple into the waiting arms of the gods, who then lower them to the floor on the other side of Olympus. As they are lowered, Yvonne reads from Jung. At the beginning of the illness, I had the feeling that there was something wrong with my attitude, and that I was to some extent responsible for the mishap. But when one affirms things as they are, without subjective protests, accepts the conditions of existence as one sees them, accepts one's own nature as one happens to be, when one lives one's own life, then one must take mistakes into the bargain. Life would not be complete without them. There is no guarantee, not for a single moment, that we will not fall into error or stumble into deadly peril. We may think there is a sure road, but that would be the road of death. Then nothing happens any longer. At any rate, not the right things. Anyone who takes the sure road is as good as dead. Such righteous sentiments. Now at this remove from that peace, it seems terribly burdened with a kind of relentless truth-mongering. What do you mean? In this last speech, Jung seems anything but righteous. Righteousness connotes a certainty that he is arguing against. It's the tone of self-congratulation or complacency of someone who has had a revelation and is laying it out. Anyone who takes the sure road is as good as dead. Really. Maybe it's simply the fact of isolating such things from a longer text that bugs me. I just don't like the sound of it. Well, you know, Shirley, that I have always had a weakness for the sweeping revelations of great men. That's why I'm going at this concert so differently. The line, oh God, you gave me so much room, is really very much more moving to me than anything I used last year, even though on an aesthetic level, I'm simply doing another form of storytelling, more intimate, less epic. What do you mean, oh God, you gave me so much room? For heaven's sakes, we've just been going through that. I, we said it in the, it was in the text, it's about these two people who uh, are very attracted to each other, and they go up in this room, and there's not much light, and they're looking for this eye shade, and, and they're maneuvering around, and, and neither one of them is really sure of the other one's feelings, and there's this little landing, and they go out on this landing, and uh, uh, the guy goes out on the landing, and he thinks he's not leaving her much room, and that she'll have to squeeze through, and later on he tells her that. When he tells her, she says, oh, God, you... You gave me so much room. Were you saying that or reading it? I was remembering it from Hofstra. I guess. <laughs> Let's go on. I'm tired of all this. 